we wanted to structure this today was to use three buzzwords, and those buzzwords are just to help frame the debate would be resources. We want to see what are the particular resources that we're dealing with. The second word would be partnerships. What kind of partnerships are we talking about between us and a relatively and a very affluent country compared to Africa? And the entire debate and all the speakers here are or have been working in Africa. And we decided to do that just to give the panel some focus. And then thirdly, we are going to use the term healthcare delivery. Now, I'm going to ask how do those three terms intersect? And I think they are three important terms because when you look at resources on both sides of the pond, many questions come out of that. Secondly, what kind of partnerships do we develop and how does that use of those partnerships impact the delivery of healthcare in those countries? So let me introduce the panelists and then get started. So this is Music City. We can start off on the right on drums. It is uh, Dr. Sonny Ariola. Um, he's a toxicologist with the Metro Nashville and Davidson County Public Health Department, where he is involved in um, development of policies and procedures for domestic preparedness relating to accidental or deliberate release of chemical, biological, radiological, or explosive devices. And he's also, and I think you are a founding member of the African Society for Toxicological Sciences. And he's going to give us a really interesting case about some toxicological case involving mining of gold that led to very high levels of lead intoxication in people working in the Zamfara province in Nigeria, a very resource limited setting and poor part in northern Nigeria. And the questions that come out of that are, here's a relatively rich country in Africa, it really is, very oil rich country, Nigeria, um, where there is considerable misappropriation of funds and resources. And one then has to ask the question, what actually happened there? Why was, were the people in that province not really seen to? How was Dr. Samuel alerted? What kind of partnership happened in that case? And how did, or how was healthcare delivery eventually affected in that, in that setting? He will tell you that a lot of this centers around, also not so much necessarily uh, 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 misappropriation of funds, but understanding. And that's one of the things he wants to uh, focus on here. So that's a case study. And secondly, we will uh, read is Dr. Mukta Ali, who's also from Nigeria, also northern Nigeria. And we're going to focus a little bit on educational issues. In his case, again, relatively rich country, Nigeria, but where and how the educational resources being allocated there, I think you told me that in the whole of Nigeria there are only a handful of neurosurgeons. What is that about? Um, why did he find it necessary to come to the United States to complete his MD and uh, um, uh, Doctorate of Public Health, which I think was at the University of um, uh, Um and well, anyway, he can fill in more on his, his background, his educational background. But the central question we want to pose there is again, these educational resources between the United States and a foreign country, what kind of educational partnerships are we setting up between those two countries? And is this the best way to do it? How does that impact healthcare delivery in Nigeria? Is it a good model to have, and we use the word brain drain, people from other countries coming to complete their education in the United States and going back and effectively helping people in those countries, or should we be putting a lot more of our resources into establishing education facilities in Nigeria? Let me just give you one statistic. A recent article in The Lancet, written by a stellar group of people led by Julio Frank, the, dean of the new dean of the Harvard School of Public Health, says we are spending 5.5 trillion in the world today on healthcare. Only 100 billion, which sounds like a lot, but that's less than 2% of that amount is actually devoted to educational development. And this is astounding in a field of healthcare, which is sort of a knowledge-based uh, discipline. 
So anyway, we're just going to explore the educational conundrum that we land up in there. And then finally, we're going to bring this full circle to uh, Dr. Uh, Morgan Wells, who's a graduate of Princeton University and Vanderbilt Medical School, and he's worked as a staff internist at the Siloam Family Health Center, which is a non-profit faith-based clinic for the uninsured in Nashville. And he's also been a leader of multiple short-term medical missions to countries in South America, Asia, and Africa. And in this case, as I said, we're going to bring this full circle. Here we have refugees coming from foreign countries into Tennessee. And what happens there? What kind of, what are we talking about resources in that case? Here we have all our resources on our own doorstep. What kind of partnerships do we form with these refugees? Do they still feel like foreigners and refugees in the United States? And are we effectively uh, delivering health care to them in that setting? Having come to that point in the debate, it poses the very unsettling question to me that if we cannot deliver health care, not only to the refugees, but to fill a million of our own people in this country, why are we going to do health care in other countries? Is that just because it's fashionable, or what is this about? I think it's a question we need to pose. If we have not cleaned up our own house, why are we trying to clean up other people's houses? But I think the best solution to that question is we need to think of global health no longer as us going to help them. It's more a question of a global society where we can both learn from each other, whereas Sir Nigel Crisp, the leader of the National Health Service in England, wrote in his book, Turning the World Upside Down, he sends British residents to Africa to learn in a resource-limited setting and come and tell him and the British Health Service how to better run the British Health Service. Because if you can function well in those settings, we we'll also have a lot to learn about that. So that is the ultimate kind of partnership we should be thinking of, not us, them, but we. And talk about sort of horizontal partnerships where both parties benefit. Anyway, so we're going to start off with Dr. Ariola. Um, he's going to talk for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll have maybe a few clarifying questions in between. Feel free to ask questions, and we'll move on and keep track of the time. So welcome, Dr. Ariola. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Uh, again, like you said, I'm originally from Nigeria. I've been in uh, Nashville here for about eight years. And uh, I was part of the African Society for Toxicological Sciences that we started about 13 years ago in Seattle. And uh, part of it is to address issues that are uh, specific to Africa as a region. So I was in Nigeria this past year in May for uh, with three uh, American colleagues to conduct a week-long uh, risk assessment training. And that's what we do as toxicologists, basically do risk assessment and look for feasible risk management options. That was um, late May slash early June. So the day before, actually two days before my departure, I got a call from the administrative capital of Nigeria, which is Abuja, about the ongoing lead poisoning incident in northwest Nigeria. That's Zamfara. As at that time, there were close to 200 deaths already recorded and uh, in five villages, uh, most of them in uh, uh, children less than five years old. So I went to Abuja. Uh, the first thing I did was uh, meet with the uh, Minister for Science and, and Technology, then speak to the media, and then meet with the Minister for Health. And so he had said at that time that uh, CDC is in Nigeria, and he has a meeting with them later that afternoon. So I, I was there, and I met with the CDC team. That CDC team was led by Antonio Neri. And I spoke with him last week, just uh, getting ready for this, to get an update on the numbers. So at that time, there were representatives from, uh, from MSF, Doctors Without Borders, CDC, um, the uh, 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 Telegraphics, which is the company here, uh, partly funded by Blacksmith that's doing the cleanup. So uh, what I'll do is just provide the basic background. That's the uh, worst lead poisoning incident in modern history. My PhD was done on lead, uh, basically uh, studying the midbrain dopaminergic mechanism of low-level lead exposure. At that time, the relevant blood lead level that we look at are right around 10, 15 micro, uh, 50 micrograms per deciliter blood lead. Now, 100% of the children that were tested there had blood lead level greater than 45 micrograms per deciliter. Uh, 
Many of them had over 400 micrograms per deciliter blood lead. And so the, uh, so, 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 uh, and the number, just the updated numbers at December last year is there are at least 284 deaths. Uh, uh, about 742 ha have are being treated for high levels of lead in their blood, and it is estimated that over 3,000 will be impacted. And that's how it happened. The, for, since 2007, the Nigerian government had been promoting mining in this part of the country. And so they had uh, uh, co companies from Asia come here and do the assessment. And so these villagers live close to where these companies are operating. And you have to understand the geopolitical setup. These people are very, very uh, rural and very poor. This is actually one of the poorest part, parts of Nigeria. A lot of the homes are, are built, uh, they are mud homes, and they have touched roofs, not corrugated iron roof. And so basically they would either go and uh, get a big piece of uh, ore or buy the ore, and they bring it into the homes where they live with little kids. And so they uh, grind, uh, they first of all break them down, and then they grind them in the same uh, system that's used to grind grains. And so it's, it's, it's exposure, and they wash these things with mercury. They wash them also in the stream where they drink from. And the same soil where those uh, 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 soil that are uh, uh, grounded soil are at the same soil that are used to build the building. So there's massive, massive roots of exposure. We think, based on what we know, that probably the two biggest roots of exposure are inhalation and oral for the most part. Uh, CDC thinks that um, oral exposure is, is more relevant to what we did. But basically, at that time, it wasn't to look at levels of lead that are more associated with neurobehavioral uh, deficits. It's more, uh, it's exceeded the level where uh, collision therapy will normally begin. And so the challenge at that time is where do we get the resources to do that? Each of the collision treatment uh, uh, costs takes about 28 days, and each one costs about $308. Now, when I got there, speaking with the Zamfara State gov 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 Governor then, he promised 10 million naira. 10 million naira, you have to understand, when you divide by 150 conversion rate, does not amount to a whole lot. And there are, at that time, there have been kids that have already gone through two or three of those treatment costs. Now, there are so many issues there. They don't, even though the government at, at that time banned that, those activities, now you are, uh, there's a lot of poverty. These people did not stop the activities. They keep bringing them in. And one person said to me, one person who lost a kid, he said, you know, I have to balance uh, uh, feeding myself and my entire family and the bike that I ride with losing one kid. And I thought that was pretty sad. But that's some of what we dealt with. And, 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 and so my, my responsibility, which is we're going to talk about resources. Talking about resources in Nigeria at the meeting, there were virtually every federal government uh, agency there, the health, all of the agencies there, even the basic laboratory equipment, uh, graphite furnace, atomic absorption, all of those things were non-existent. And so, so when we talk about resources, it takes a lot to, if you've been here, to understand really what we're talking about. And Nigeria, like uh, uh, Dr. Agbom rightly said, is a rich country. But there's a lot of educational activities that we've been trying to do, first of all, to get the government to understand uh, that these things are important. And the government, uh, you, even here, we still have to na navigate the political structure, but it's even bigger in Nigeria, getting them to uh, and I remember one of the, the epidemiologists for the Ministry of Health, who has been out of the country and is the lead person in charge of this, uh, basically we're discussing what do we do, including monitoring uh, this cohort, this identified cohort over time, to look for long-term uh, uh, behavioral uh, uh, changes, which we know is going to be there. It's not the primary uh, uh, concern right now. And his, his, his question was, what if we find something? What, what are we going to do? And uh, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a different, uh, we can talk about resources. A lot, every, virtually everything that was done from screening the case to the treatment had to be imported at that particular time, mostly by MSF. So the uh, XRF, the lead screening thing had to be brought in. The collating agent had to be brought in. The clinics had to be equipped to deal with that. And so at the last count, it's gone from five villages to almost 10 villages, 
and I've given you the updated number up until, until the end of December. Those numbers, are, 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 they keep going up. And so, uh, talking about the ASTS, which is the organization that I have found and I've been the president for the past four years, what we've tried to do, and we've worked with NIEHS, National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, CTAC, and several organizations, and we're saying um, the things, the feasible risk management options that we have has to be uh, 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 challenged with the existing geopolitical structure. We have to have an understanding of region-specific sentiments and know which ones are more likely to work and which ones are not. Uh, I remember actually, actually also talking with the Minister of Health in Nigeria. One of the things that he said was, you know, uh, you guys are blaming us. Um, you always come here complaining. And I said, no. So they, you have to deal with those attitudes. And one of the things that I pitch to people is, we understand that we've worked in Cameroon, we've worked in South Africa, we have worked in several places, and there's so many agencies that are bringing resources into Africa into those things. I, I'm just not sure that we are getting uh, uh, enough out of them like we would if we understand uh, the, the structure better. And so, so one of the things that I say is there are basically when we teach environmental health, we are trying to understand uh, the three transitions. We are looking at the environmental risk transition, demographic transition as well as the uh, epidemiological transition. Africa is in a different stage than most developed countries. For example, Africa would be like in stage one of demographic transition where mortality rate is very high and as well as uh, fertility rate is high. So you, most of the population actually is, is young. When I left Nigeria, the life expectancy in Nigeria was in the low 60s. Right now, it ranges from 39 to about 50. And most of the death occurring from malaria as well as exposure to enteropathogens. So uh, the reason I'm saying that is you have those issues, you have people building um, septic uh, well water, uh, drinking water wells right beside the septic system. And you still have the malaria issue, you have issues of malnutrition. And so any of these um, developmental industrial issues is, is adding to the existing conditions that at the minimum is predisposing people to uh, multiple hazards. So that's the one thing that we, we uh, the two things I've said is understanding, identifying, and prioritizing based on our understanding of the stages that they are in these three transitions. Secondly is understanding the geopolitical divides. And Gates Foundation, several other agencies already work in Africa, and so what we are doing with them is with Simon's Bridge, and which is what I did with CDC in this response. I was only in Nigeria for about a week throughout this period, but every time that they can't get things through in Nigeria, they will call me. I place a call to the ministers and those people and make sure that they have the resources that they, that they need. Uh, sometimes that's what we need to do to let people understand this is serious. We pushed the president there to declare a state of emergency so that some money that was available at the United States Embassy in Nigeria can be uh, released and that can be used to purchase some of the collecting agents there. And so uh, uh, sad as it is, we are still, there's a lot of uh, people that are still dying. There's a lot of kids that are still, that have gone through three courses of this uh, treatment and we're still having very high levels. Uh, uh, but it is what it is and that's what we're doing. And in terms of, one more thing, in terms of okay. health care delivery, you have to understand a, a, a Nigeria is a different setup. Uh, uh, most of, every, virtually everything is government, uh, government uh, run or government funded. And one of the things that we are working on now with a, a group here also is uh, to um, go and equip, equip some of those hospitals. A lot of the clinics are not equipped even to do basic stuff, so. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open up for a couple of questions um, before moving on, otherwise people may forget where we are in this. Let me just kick it off with a quick question here because it always intrigues me. Um, you had spoken to me about the, uh, the question of getting through to politicians, and I think as medical students and doctors here, it's often a tricky thing. We're so taught to focus on the patient-doctor relationship that we often lose sight of the broader policy issues. Um, and I think that's one reason business has taken over medicine in the United States. But give us some insight as to what that really took in Nigeria and whether you have any things to mention to say to a medical student class about operating both on the immediate care level and on sort of a more of a policy level. Okay. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, in terms of the policy, again, even in this country, we have to navigate the political system. Um, a, the past eight years, I've been a public health uh, toxicologist uh, at the local and the state level. Um, sadly to say, I'm, I may not be too diplomatic saying this, but that's not really what I'm trying to. At the higher you go up, really the, the, the lower the level of understanding of the risk that is there. So you have to explain the risk, you have to explain the importance, and you have to do the risk-benefit analysis to make sure they understand that this is a serious issue. In a country with Nigeria, just getting pollutants, environmental, industrial-related uh, incident, uh, making that more important than the traditional issues of malaria, infectious disease, is a challenge by itself. Now, but if you have this many deaths, it does catch people's attention. In terms of doctor-patient relationship, one of the biggest things that I know has been going on with WHO is, that's a big part of it, because the kind of respectful relationship you have now between patients and doctor really doesn't exist there. It's more, uh, pretty close to being a master-servant relationship between doctors. So, you know, that, that's a different, different concern uh, about that. But, does that answer your question? Sure. Yeah. Right. Come here, Oh, there's a question. Yeah. Well, uh, excellent question. We uh, did anyone hear the question? I think you're essentially asking uh, what kind of resources are you working with over here? Okay. Uh, well, I, I basically have worked with so many organizations, but I'll give you a, an example of the ones I'm currently working with now. We just sent a big uh, shipment of uh, uh, two antibiotics uh, to Nigeria. It was going to be thrown away, and we got it. Uh, I, 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 that company wants to remain kind of out. But in terms of equipping the hospital, that's Project Cure. What Project Cure will do is, and they'll be all over the world, they will go to the government over there has to pay for an assessment by one of their staff. The staff will go to all of the hospitals, assess the need. You have to demonstrate a couple of things, including that you have staff there that are able to maintain the equipment and repair them. And you have to demonstrate to them that you pay for the shipment and the clearing. And it will. Now, those things look very, very easy here. But even the, the drugs that we send, I had to spend a lot of energy calling uh, NAFTA, which is Nigeria's equivalent of FDA a here, to get the drugs across, there's so many issues there. But Project Kio has been doing that for several years. The equipment are free, some are new, some are used, and they, they will assess what is needed. And so we, that's been done in a couple of states in Nigeria. We're actually looking at the state that I'm from now, uh, uh, going through the assessment of all the clinics, what's needed, and they will supply the equipment after somebody here has gone to do the assessment. I think we're going to have to move on. We just probably have two questions between each speaker. So next is Dr. Aliyah, and I didn't introduce you very well, so I'm gonna say one word. Um, he was until recently assistant professor of preventive medicine, Mayo Clinic of Medicine. He attended medical school at Amaru Bello University in Nigeria, holds a master of public health from George Washington University and a doctorate in public health, epidemiology and international health from the University of Alabama in Birmingham. Currently is an assistant professor of preventive medicine in the Vanderbilt Institute of Global Health. So welcome. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ekpom. Um, well, the, the talking points that I was asked to comment on have to do with uh, education in uh, developing countries, specifically in Nigeria, and my own uh, personal experiences. I moved uh, to the U.S. in uh, early uh, 2000, and um, the basic reason why I moved was really to uh, come here and uh, do a master's in public health at George Washington University. At that time, uh, we didn't have, really, we did not have any school of public health in Nigeria. We did have MPH programs, but there were very few. Uh, there were either two or three MPH programs in the entire country. Um, right now, we have a lot more than, uh, than that, but at that time, that was all we had. And if you wanted to do an MPH, you either had to go to Europe, to the United Kingdom, or uh, move to the United States. 
and my wife uh, thought uh, the United States was cooler, so, <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up coming here. So anyway, that was the re major reason why I came here, and uh, one thing led to the other, led to another, and uh, ended up doing a doctorate in public health and uh, got some research experience and uh, decided that, well, what I wanted to do really, um, it's, it makes more sense for me to do it from this end. So I ended up uh, doing a residency uh, program, then uh, working with uh, some of the people that work at the institute, uh, Dr. Stan Bermond, and uh, writing up a grant proposal that had to do with a HIV program in Nigeria, which luckily we got funded and uh, which has given me an opportunity to go back home and pay back in some way to the system that, uh, that uh, really helped in uh, making me what I am now. So, um, and this experience is not unique to me. Uh, there are several thousand uh, Nigerian physicians practicing in the United States uh, right now, and uh, most of us, that was the, that was the uh, process we followed. Um, there are a lot of limitations in uh, working in that part of the world. Every time I uh, travel to Nigeria, I, I remember the the difficulties uh, in seeing patients and being able to provide quality care and uh, being thankful for uh, being able to provide uh, uh, quality care and uh, providing some sort of uh, personal uh, satisfaction uh, as part of my day-to-day -day practice. So, uh, so in terms of academic, um, in terms of resources, yeah, resources are very limited, but uh, the limitation, there's so much disparity between African countries. Africa is not one big homogeneous uh, entity. Uh, just like uh, Doug Hamburger is here, uh, I just got back from Zambia a couple of weeks ago. Uh, until very recently, Zambia had only one medical school, a country of about 13, 14 million people. And, uh, the total number of uh, physicians practicing in Zambia is almost equivalent to the number of providers we have here at Vanderbilt, 600 and something. So it just gives you an idea of the disparity, the really the resource, uh, the limited uh, resource limitations that uh, are prevalent in that part of the world. Nigeria is a lot better because, uh, partly because Nigeria has a lot more resources uh, in terms of uh, oil. It's the fifth largest oil producing, oil exporting country in the world. If you uh, buy uh, gas here, the probability is, uh, there's a 20% probability that it's gas, that it's oil that was actually uh, drilled from Nigeria. So in terms of resources, there are, there are substantial resources, only that they've been misallocated. Uh, we've, uh, in terms of GNP, it's just 4.8% 4 .4 of GNP that goes to providing uh, health care in the country. And this, this, this uh, question of uh, low resources, inadequate resources, uh, poor um, uh, educational opportunities uh, impact everything, everything that goes on there. And a typical example is the lead incident in, in Zamfara State. The lead incident there, took, it, it didn't just occur all of a sudden. These people have been mining lead, and, um, but because they did not have public health uh, uh, epidemiologists in that part of the country, they have very few health providers. Nobody actually picked it up until the whole thing got out of control. Um, they had uh, s some, uh, the official statistics is like 280 kids died, 280 children died. But the unofficial statistics is something like 400. And this is something that's still ongoing. The uh, environmental impact uh, uh, guys went in and uh, did uh, decontamination of the soil. But because there's so much poverty in that part of the country, uh, most of the people that, uh, the major reason, really the, the, back, the major reason why that happened is still there. People are still going back and they're still mining for gold and they're still carrying the uh, gold iron ores home and they're still contaminating uh, the environment. Uh, the group, the same group that did the environmental impact assessment went back in early January and the official report was that it seems like areas where the lead concentrations had gone down, the lead concentrations were coming up again, the soil uh, lead concentrations. So it's a, it's a major problem and uh, it's something that uh, requires uh, some form of um, programs with sustainability that would really make an impact. And for us to do that, we have to ensure that the people really understand the nature of the problem. 
uh, most of the children that were initially diagnosed with high lead levels, most of them were dying and the diagnosis was malaria because there were no resources to really diagnose uh, elevated blood lead levels in that part of the world. So, um, but because there's so much poverty, the families don't have an option. Farming is not a, is not a viable option. In, in the soil is very arid, it's not very uh, productive, so the best way for the families to make a living is to, is, is to go down and uh, mine for, for gold. And uh, if they don't have an option, that's what they will continue doing despite what everyone is trying to do. So, so my, my uh, sorry I digressed a little bit there, but uh, the, the issue is something that uh, is really, it's really, of, uh, it's really of concern to anyone who, who really cares about public health. Uh, this was the worst single lead poisoning incident the world has ever seen, the worst. A hundred so, times blood lead level concentration. Doctor, let me interject there, because yeah. um, I just want to ask you to focus on the educational yes, issue so, here. Yeah, so. I digress, but um, I'm mm -hmm. just trying to link up the, the two issues. So resources are, are a major reason. Because there's so much, um, there's, there's a deficiency in terms of uh, available uh, academic opportunities. We don't have enough providers to really uh, act as a, as a warning, uh, to provide that early warning uh, system. Then uh, one of the points that uh, I digress a little bit, but uh, pardon me. One of the other points is um, how does my experience impact uh, the way we, I currently provide, uh, we currently provide HIV programs in Nigeria. Well, coming from that part of the world um, and having those networks and knowing uh, how the system works always makes things uh, a lot easier. Uh, it's been much easier for us to set up programs in country because we, have, we already have the contacts that we need to uh, get things going. Uh, then the other question was really uh, priorities. Um, how do we prioritize global um, uh, initiatives uh, in that part of the world, considering that it's not just one single program, problem that we're facing. HIV is a big problem, but malaria is probably a bigger problem. Maternity, maternal mortality, women continue to die during uh, childbirth. Um, diarrheal disease, respiratory infections, all those are major problems. And having a way to prioritize those problems is extremely uh, important, being able to tackle the most important problems first. But how, how do we know which ones are the most important problems? Do we look at mortality, how many people die? Or do we look at morbidity, how many people actually come down with that disease? And do we look at economic impact, which disease has the greatest economic impact? So there are a lot of un unanswered questions when it comes to uh, prioritizing. And of course, when we are prioritizing, we have to also take the community into consideration. What are the things the community thinks is really important? A lot of people have uh, second thoughts about HIV programs, especially in the early part of uh, the AIDS epidemic, because they thought malaria is a, which, which, which is true, malaria is a bigger problem, so why don't we channel all those funds to malaria programs uh, instead of uh, to HIV? So uh, there are a lot of un un unanswered questions when it comes to uh, uh, global health initiatives. But overall, we do have, um, the system is improving. There's, uh, democracy has been, uh, we've had a transition from a civilian to a civilian administration for the first time in history in Nigeria. And um, uh, corruption, even though there's still ongoing corruption, but things are uh, hopefully are getting better. And um, could, could you answer the question? Um, in terms of educational resources, yes. um, and you and I spoke about this as well, what would it have taken to keep people, highly qualified people like yourself in Nigeria? Is that the wrong model? Should we allow people to operate in any model? Should we be building or having sort of alloc a different kind of allocation of educational institutions within Nigeria? to keep people there? What is missing in this equation in terms of partnerships? There are a lot, lot of things that are missing. Um, in the early 70s, Nigerians have always moved um, out of, outside Nigeria to, um, for educational opportunities. But in the, in the 70s, because the economy is doing better and uh, you have really opportunities to really practice pr and practice good medicine, good medicine, uh, the physicians tended to come back. But in the 80s, after the economy uh, got bad, um, all those that went out for educational opportunities ended up staying there because you move back, you don't, uh, you're not able to provide uh, 
the quality of services as a, as a physician that you're expected to provide, and you're not able to really uh, earn a good income that will sustain your family. So for a lot of physicians, that was when physicians started uh, staying back after they had trained. Uh, there is no single model that I would say uh, works best. Um, I know that Vanderbilt has, uh, has been in the forefront with our ATERP uh, uh, grants, uh, uh, our MEPI, the MEPI grant. We've been doing a lot of uh, educational, uh, medical education uh, work in Zambia especially, and um, uh, this is one of the ways that we can do it. Uh, training at UAB, personally, I've, I've known at least 10 Zambian physicians who came to Birmingham and trained in Birmingham, did their MPH programs, and then moved back to Zambia, which is a really good model. But if you have a situation where um, some individuals use their own personal funds to come over and train, then you, there's no way you can uh, insert a clause that that person has to, has to go back. The only way that you can really enforce that is if in some way you use public funds, then you can include it as a clause as part, a clause as part of the training. We have time just for one quick question. No questions for me? No. <laughs> Someone has to ask a question. How did your wife like Minnesota? <laughs> <laughs> she meant colder, not cooler. She loved it. She actually loved it, yeah. <laughs> any, any question? Oh, there's one. I just need to repeat the question because it's being recorded. You're asking about um, the sort of balance between physicians and public health uh, um, trained people about how they uh, address a question such as Dr. Aliu has been discussing. Yes, so um, it's, 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 uh, it's not something that physicians alone, yes, it's not something that physicians alone can help uh, resolve. Uh, the government has to be in on it. Uh, public health professionals have to be involved. Uh, the limited number of public health programs that have existed in the country makes it a lot less likely that you'd have individuals with MPH degrees who don't have a medical background. In fact, the very first uh, public MPH program we had in the country, the second MPH program we had in the country was restricted just to physicians. Only physicians, people with a medical background could, uh, could do it. But, but yeah, and, and of course, it's not just uh, uh, epidemiologists, but it's uh, people like health education workers, community health extension workers, community health officers, who also could play a role, a very vital role there. Then, of course, the government, if the government had really uh, cared about setting up uh, rural health centers in the different parts of the state, then they would have been able to pick up the typical uh, presentation, because even though malaria, they, you can present with uh, neurological presentations in malaria, but, but these were atypical, really atypical cases, and someone should have, should have uh, said, hey, this looks a little bit different from classical malaria. So, um, so yeah, it's, it should be something, it's, it's not something that really just providers would, would be able to uh, uh, take care of. The government has to be involved, and the community leaders have to be involved as well. The literacy level in Nigeria is just 60% in women, 70% in adults. It gives you an idea of how low, <coughs> how low uh, literacy levels are in general. So, um, yeah, we're going to have to move on because yeah. we're running out of time. So, Dr. Will's going to talk about the Siloam Family Foundation and the refugee. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm not from Nigeria. <laughs> But uh, I have had a formative experience you. just west of Nigeria and Ghana, West Africa, where I was first exposed to uh, really a career, possible possibility of a career in healthcare just out of college. And so I think that that experience has formed how I've thought about practicing medicine back here in the States. And it's serendipitous and uh, ironic and beautiful that I've ended up at a clinical setting at Salome, where we care for um, immigrants and refugees from about 90 countries around the world. Um, 
This was not by design. Um, it was really an artifact of us uh, establishing a volunteer driven clinic on a Saturday morning in the Edge Hill neighborhood and a few <coughs> Vietnamese refugees hearing about it by word of mouth and them telling two friends and them telling two friends. And um, today I think we saw uh, this past year about 80% of our patients are born uh, in other countries. Somewhere along the road we began to see uh, the actual newly arriving refugees as well. And for several years we did this without pay but eventually we're able to negotiate an agreement with the federal government and their intermediaries to implement the newly arriving refugee uh, physical program. So they're, all new arriving refugees are required to be seen within 30 days of arriving in their country of destination and uh, evaluated by a medical uh, exam and ruling out uh, infectious or other uh, significant diseases. And uh, so we've been doing that for about seven years now. Um, and when I say we do this, we see a real tip of the iceberg of the refugee problems around the world. Um, if you think about 40 million people being displaced uh, around the world today, about 20 million of those are qualified as refugees, and about 50 to 80,000 of those resettle in the United States each year. So that's already a very small number. Nashville receives a disproportionate share for the region because of the uh, headquarters for both Catholic Charities and World Relief, which are two of the intermediary nonprofits that help resettle people. Um, but one of the reasons for this dynamic of Nashville and middle American cities being such a prime hotspot for them is the, uh, the reality that refugees are no longer coming by boat. They're looking for uh, economic opportunity uh, and high nonprofit sectors where people can collaborate, partner, all these terms you're talking about to leverage resources to help them make the transition. Um, so that's a segue to just the, the buzzwords, resources, uh, partnership, and healthcare delivery. That's sort of the story of how we've grown over the past 15 to 20 years. Um, as a nonprofit, we work a lot with other nonprofits, uh, foundations. Nashville is the beneficiary of a lot of medically interested foundations because of the large for-profit uh, healthcare industry that is uh, centered here. Uh, the faith community is one of those significant nonprofit organizations that works with us um, to uh, facilitate care for the underserved. The government, as I mentioned, this refugee contract is one example of that. And the academy, Vanderbilt's been a great partner in many ways, one of which simply is just providing access to a language line uh, that we can use for telephone interpretation on a daily basis with our patients. Um, but also students. So I've had an emphasis student from Vanderbilt work with me and helping to um, do an outreach for Sudanese lost boys. Um, about eight years ago, it was determined that there was a prevalence of about 40 to 50% among Sudanese lost boy refugees of ongoing schistosomiasis or strongylodiasis. Uh, these are illnesses that don't have any significant, uh, maybe ongoing acute effects, but can have significant long-term chronic effects, including cancer and, um, and death um, uh, in the host. Uh, and we were able to leverage out of one of the drug manufacturers a donated supply of Prozaquantil to treat the, the schistosomiasis and help them, encourage them to set up a program to uh, donate uh, samples to other communities around the country who were dealing with the lost boys. So that's just one example. Others have been around mental health care, using representatives from Centerstone Mental Health and even bringing one on staff to do screening because of the high, high burden of post-traumatic stress and other mental health problems. So um, those are just a few of the, the ways we've been trying to uh, use limited resources uh, and partnerships to deliver health care. Um, some of the lessons we've been making have been from the developing world. So the idea of the community health worker model is slowly working its way into American health care as we struggle with the reality of chronic disease. This is probably going to be even more helpful in some of the, the populations that we have who don't speak the language and are ethnically isolated from the rest of the community. Um, and um, I think if I was to make a recommendation about a global health initiative that would help improve the health of refugees coming here, um, it would probably be to actually systematize and um, use a best practice uh, formula for the pre-departure screening and treatment of refugees. But right now it's a very ad hoc situation that varies from refugee camp to refugee camp. It's not standardized, and as a result, we pay three times the cost to vaccinate 
uh, the refugees after they arrive here as just one example. And not even all of them are we're able to follow up on because it's very challenging uh, to follow up on all the patients. That in turn might be another interesting collaboration with someone like the Institute for Global Health would be to develop ongoing surveillance and protocols, long-term follow-up of some of the refugees who arrive here and see and ensure that they get the care they need. Thank you. So I know some of you have to go, but let's open it up for some questions in the last few minutes from the audience. Good. So the question was to Dr. Ariola about whether the companies have any responsibility to providing health care towards their workers. Yeah, excellent question. I was actually going through um, one of the updates from MSF, and part of what they're doing is challenging those companies to, they've made money from this process, uh, be a part of it. Now, uh, the other part of it is a lot of uh, occupational health training standards that we have in this country really do not exist in Nigeria. So one of the things that uh, uh, actually that was a major part of the training that we had, encouraging them to um, start a, a process where they begin to take care of their workers, have standards, have expectations, have inspection programs like we typically have there. And if you do, then you hold, you have an avenue for holding the companies responsible. If you follow the news in Nigeria, oil bring, bring, being the biggest uh, um, uh, source of money for the, for the country, it's, it's producing a part of Nigeria that has the worst environmental degradation you'll ever see. So a lot of the multinational companies, the things they do in Nigeria and other parts of Africa, they can't do it in other parts of the world. So this area, you will have to see the pictures, you'll have to see what's going on, you have to see the number of deaths, you have to read the reports to know how bad situations are. But it's not entirely the fault of the company, it's, entire, it's also part of the system. Even when they have allocated resources to do that, the system have not allowed the resources to be used appropriately. So we're talking about a, a very complex system without um, a simple solution. But I guess part of our responsibility is educational, educational to the uh, politicians, the power brokers, to understand that this have, uh, this have ultimately impact on not just the economy but on the health of people. And one of the things that he mentioned to me, one of the biggest things is uh, uh, not just bandwidth in terms of having access to research data, but it's also informatics, surveillance. We are doing population health. We don't have all of those basic things. They're typically not available. When they are available, they're still in paper form. Accessing them is a big problem, so. Did you have a question? Dr. Willis, uh, I'm interested to hear your answer to the question earlier about the needs that we have here and why we should go abroad and where our population has the least to address in this country. So the question was, um, Dr. Wills, uh, to respond to seeing to the local needs, as we mentioned in the introduction, compared to the health care delivery we do in uh, developing countries or elsewhere? Well, first of all, uh, Matt, you would not have been able to do your emphasis project <laughs> if, you if we didn't have some attention to global health needs. But, uh, I think Dr. Eichbaum pointed out very uh, eloquently at the beginning that we live in a global society regardless right now. We are whether it's refugees, immigrants, visitors, legal, illegal, otherwise, there is increasing circulation of pathogens, diseases, and uh, people uh, all around the world. So it's, we can't isolate it out. Now, you may tease out priorities um, and ensuring that we have a, a safe system for people to land in here when they get here, but I think we would be foolish to ignore the fact that the disparities in the other parts of the world, really economic, and, and political issues probably even as much or more so than the actual health issues driving people to flee these places. So if we don't pay attention to that, we'll, we'll, our issues will only get worse here.
So that question was just to repeat it. A very good question about what advice the three panelists might have for medical students and other healthcare workers going overseas in terms of forging effective and sustainable healthcare partnerships. Yeah, I, I can take a first crack at that. Um, the, I, I'm originally from Nigeria, and I've been here for about 18 years. So I see the, um, and I've been to other parts of Africa, I see the massive need. Uh, it's pretty tough to comprehend until you see it. So, and I've seen so many people go to Africa to help, and I don't think there's any effort that's given there that's a waste, okay? Not, number one, it's not nearly adequate. So when you go there, especially if you are targeting a specific issue, um, you will be impacting lives, you'll be making a contribution. Now, I've, in the, course, in the past 10, 12 years, I've spoken with some people from Vanderbilt, people from all over the world going to Africa, asking me what things are. Most people are going to either with a specific organization or to address a specific uh, challenge. And there are agencies that are doing a lot, of, a lot of work, Doctors Without Border, Gates Foundation, so many people. And typically, they are either addressing a disaster, an imagined problem, or doing specific things. And I know there are many people here also who travel to other parts of Africa. So if you are going to do a specific thing, I think that's okay. On the, on the um, policy level or approach level for multiple organizations, uh, uh, my earlier comment was more to make uh, the limited resources that they are provided to make it more imp impactful. And that's not throwing the responsibility on them. That responsibility is probably on the African government to uh, come up with a way for these organizations to understand all of the variables that can impact the, uh, that can affect the impact of the efforts. Channel them uh, uh, appropriately so you get the best benefits out of them. I'll be very brief this time around. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I would say just the, the main thing is probably know, know what you want to go and do. Um, it don't, be, don't let it just look like simply you want to go and help. You should have an idea of what it is you're more passionate about and uh, know the people who do that. You still have what we call maternity, the local clinics there. But the bottom line is they're, for the most part, they're like houses. You don't have the supplies, you don't have the equipment, and I think the other part is there is um, at one time in major in, uh, parts of Nigeria we had the, what they call the free health care thing that's supposed to be funded by the government, but it's, 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 not, uh, it's not well done. And from my experience, if you go to the doctor in Nigeria, they're going to write you a medication, you have to go to the pharmacy to pick it up, and that's another challenge. There's a lot of adulterated, unregulated med medicines there, so I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, it's a different model. Um, anyway, we've gone over time, so I want to thank the three panelists very much for their <laughs> stimulating. <laughs>